Of all the archetypes for evil characters, there's one type that really stands out. The psychopath. Now, what is psychopathy? Most people probably got its definition mixed up with sociopathy or being psychotic. So let's get our definition of a psychopathic villain established out of the gate. Psychopaths are cold and uncaring and can come across as emotionless. They are unable to feel empathy for others and often in fiction, psychopathic villains see others as lesser. Now, don't get psychopathy confused with psychosis. Psychopaths are not defined by being impulsive, crazy, or losing their minds. This isn't a ranking of how insane a character is, so more over the top characters, aren't exactly what we're looking for, so I don't expect Junko anytime soon. No! No! Does not compute! Does not compute! Let's take a look at the calculating, the cold, the charismatic, and the cruel. Persona 4 went for lower stakes compared to most other Megami Tensei games. Rather than saving the world from an all-powerful god, most of the game involves you solving a murder mystery in a small town by fighting shadows in an alternate dimension accessed by going into a TV. Hey, it doesn't say it was any less weird. And like any good murder mystery, there's tons of misdirection before you get to the real culprit, Adachi. At first glance, Adachi seems like the complete and utter opposite of a psychopath. He's a newbie police detective who's incompetent to the point of just being adorable. Compared to his partner on the case, Dojima, he feels like a kid on the world's most poorly timed bring your kid to work day. Are you crazy? That's not blood. That's clearly crime scene oil. Never heard of crime scene oil. That's because they stopped using it in the mid 70s. Once you correctly figure out he's the killer though, he does a complete 180. He was manipulating you the entire game, and Namatami was nothing more than his misguided pawn. As it turns out, Adachi also has the ability to summon a persona. Heck, his is even an evil version of Narukami's. And then there's how his own development serves as a perversion of the heroes. All of them had to deal with unfair circumstances in life, but were able to overcome them thanks to confiding in others. Adachi, on the other hand, just sunk further into his self-delusions. He doesn't have any aspirations to conquer the world, just have fun in his own sadistic way. If you're not careful, he can trick the characters and by extension the player into getting the bad ending. Golden makes things all the worse since it adds the ability to establish a friendship with him, giving you even more of his actions to shudder over in hindsight. And if you feel like it, you can let him get away with everything right in front of you. The only reason I can't rank Adachi any higher is because his schemes start out less as a result of his own cunning and more as a result of really dumb luck. Lucky. What is it about true crime shows that draw our attention? Is it the mystery of the crime committed or the morbid curiosity of the motive? What drives a murderer to commit their grisly deeds? Money, notoriety, revenge. Well, in this case, that need to kill in your head is art! Which brings us to Jin, the virtuoso, an eerie serial killer hidden behind a mask. He is an ace marksman with a twisted fascination with death. To him, killing isn't a necessity, it is an art. And the target is at their most beautiful once they've met their fate. And it's his goal in life to make sure every death is a perfect masterpiece. He also has a particularly eerie flower motif, symbolized in his cinematic trailer where his performers explode into a blossom of flowers upon their demise. If his mindset wasn't terrifying enough, just listen to his voice. He barely ever raises it except to laugh. 
other times. There is no drama in a peaceful death. And now the curtain rises. Only perfection is acceptable. <laughs> I think I leaked a little transmission fluid. Something else about Jin is that he's got this weird fixation on the number four. Like, everything he does is in fours. His gun? Four bullets. The dancing grenade can take out four enemies, and his fourth shots deal extra damage. The number four, the Japanese number of death, is practically embedded in him. So when he's preparing to kill, does it count as foreplay? I begged her not to. I did it anyway, and you'd be worried if I didn't. Dang it, she's right. Horrible puns aside, it's not hard to see what makes Jin so terrifying. His murder spree is a production. He's the director, and anyone in his sight is his performers. His puppets, if you will. His acts are horrendous, but he's still toned down and quiet. And a few lines hint that he can't control it. He needs to be this deadly performing artist. I swear each performance is the last, but I lie every time. Whether he means this or not, the compulsion to make art until somebody dies makes him a legitimate threat, coupled with an unhinged design and an obsessive kit. With GTA 6 coming out next year, I think it's a great time to look back on one of Rockstar's most prolific psychopaths. A psycho who assists the main characters, but then becomes a problem for everyone around them due to how unhinged he is. Despite his obvious paranoia, he was actually able to manipulate everyone into doing what he wanted, leading to everything crashing down for the main characters and one of them getting expelled. Wait, expelled? Oh, right, we're talking about Gary from Bully. <laughs> it's silly me, I forgot my own avoid over-the-top characters rule. Yeah, people forget how manipulative Gary was. Just because we didn't have guns and hookers didn't mean we can't have devious dastards. He started out as your friend, but you can tell right away he wasn't all there. You even think of Headmaster Crabblesnitch was going to be the main bad guy considering how he treats you. Well... Gary stops taking his meds, declares war in front of the whole school, and puts you in a cage match with the biggest bully in the district. And despite saying he wants to rule the school publicly, each of the cliques still listens to him. Our boy Jimmy is stuck going to situations where he has to take down each clique due to misunderstandings with Gary. Jimmy wins, but that was Gary's plan. He gets Jimmy expelled, gets the townies to go after him, and becomes head of the school. You know what? Gary? You're not a good friend. Why did Gary do all of this? Because he could. He thought Jimmy was going to betray him and decided to counter betray him first out of sheer paranoia. And it worked until Jimmy got the bullies and townies to help him take back the school. The two end up fighting on top of the building where Gary reveals his whole master plan. But it's so long-winded that Jimmy just chases after him and ignores it for the most part. And honestly, I'm half tempted to join him. What places Gary lower is that most of the manipulation we see him do is off-screen. We see him publicly get to the preppies, but then he doesn't show up until the final chapter, only being mentioned spreading rumors. But if you wanted to say he should place higher because of that, then I probably wouldn't argue with you. After all, some of the best manipulators are the ones who work behind the scenes and are never noticed. And Gary played that role very well. Ace Attorney is a series with a whole cavalcade of baddies of all kinds of flavors. But the thing is, a lot of Ace Attorney characters are way too over the top and emotional to really count here. All except for one, and if you know Ace Attorney, the very mention of his name invokes fear. The one and only, invincible, Manfred von Karma. Manfred von Karma? Being the very first final villain of the franchise, 
Manfred's deeds and influence have massive ripple effects throughout the entire story going forward. We meet him initially as the staunch, orderly, and terrifyingly serious prosecutor whose legacy is to be feared. Miles Edgeworth, his protege and your rival up to this point, is under trial for the murder of a man connected to his past, and Von Karma is prosecuting the case. Unlike Edgeworth, whose stoic nature slowly cracks through the story and is subject to all the shenanigans of the Ace Attorney Court, Von Karma takes absolutely none of it. Manfred outright orders around you, the witnesses, the detectives, and even the judge to him the court is his, and he's not above assaulting Phoenix and Maya outside of the court with a taser when they try to dig up details of the DL6 incident. Speaking of which, why don't we talk about that little elephant in the room, shall we? Back in the day, Miles' father, Gregory Edgeworth, was assigned as a defense attorney on a case prosecuted by the man himself. And during that case, he forced a false confession of guilt out of the accused. While ultimately Von Karma did win the case, he was under fire for his disregard for standard court procedures and received a single penalty on his then perfect record. This tiny slight on his ego was enough to send Von Karma into a rage. So instead of channeling this healthily or just sucking it up and letting go, Von Karma ambushed Gregory in an elevator, taking advantage of a sudden earthquake that blacked out the power and rendered everyone inside unconscious, and shot Gregory dead with as much personal investment as if you'd wiped out a stay. He left Gregory's corpse with the elevator's other occupants, a bailiff named Yanni Yogi, and Gregory's own son, Miles. I've been traumatized! This single act sent everything into motion. The Fey Clan's involvement with the law, Maya's disappearing mother, Mia's death, and Edgeworth's PTSD changing him into an emotionally stunted prosecutor set down a darker path. The DL6 was the origin for all of these. And if you think it stopped there, oh no! Von Karma ended up adopting Miles. The overly charitable among you would say this was motivated by guilt, but Realistically, it's far more likely he could make sure Miles wasn't a liability for him, especially when you learn that Miles' need for perfection and his shaky sense of self were all issues either instilled in him or worsened by Von Karma's need for control over absolutely everything. When the statute of limitations starts running out on DL6, Von Karma decides, hey, I'm just gonna frame Miles for murder just to wash my hands clean of this whole thing once and for all. So he kills a man that slighted him, raises his son to work under him, resulting in said offspring becoming a brooding edgelord with a whole host of issues, and throws him out like trash only for Miles to be saved by a plucky dumb protagonist. Wait a second, Manfred von Karma is just Frieza if he was a lawyer. Maybe, is he racist? In stark contrast to nearly every other villain in the franchise, Manfred is taken deathly seriously all the time, even before he's marked as the culprit. He's terrifying to go against. This monolith of the law barely so much as flinches until you finally break him with undeniable evidence that proves his guilt. A bullet fired off in the struggle in the elevator, but was still embedded in his chest, something Manfred was too proud and arrogant to have removed. But even after he's arrested, found guilty, and presumably executed, the shadow of Manfred von Karma looms over the entire Ace Attorney saga. Let the tearing of limbs commence! Chop chop! Okay, anyone confident enough to walk around in that much swag has to be a psycho. When you're the hero of Bower Lake looking to dethrone the despicable mayor of Bowerstone, you need all the help you can get. Unfortunately, one of the few people you need to depend on is a vain nutcase named Reaver. He's the hero of skill, a pirate, and a pretty dang good marksman. He'd have to be to be able to shoot a captain from across the water. When you meet him, he comes off as a bit of a snobby eccentric, but trust me. 
Get to know him and you'll see he's way worse. Already, he's a narcissist whose only desire is self-fulfillment. And you've basically got to dazzle him into agreeing to this alliance. He'll shoot anyone who doesn't get his art piece just right. Oh, and turns out he is an errand boy for a shadow cult, bringing them unsuspecting people to sacrifice their youth to keep himself baby-faced. Whether the next banquet is yourself or a young girl depends on how selfish you want to make your character. Unfortunately for you, he's the best shot you've got. So whether you like it or not, and you won't, you're stuck with him. At least until after the main story for Fable 2. Oh, and when you next meet him in Fable 3, he only gets worse. He became a rich industrialist with all the compassion and fairness of a GameStop manager who openly and proudly promotes child labor. Oh, and uh, he also hosts masquerade parties where he gets to kill people because why not? Why do I picture him investing in the Hunger Games because he <laughs> funny? But of course, Reaver didn't start out as an unhinged aristocrat. The whole reason he's been dealing with the Shadow Court is because he genuinely fears growing old and death. It's an understandable fear, but he took the coward's way out by selling out innocent people and it cost him his village and a loved one. Then I see him running madly through fields, the realization of just what price he has unwittingly paid hanging like a tragedy mask from his face. He falls to his knees before the town he called home, now a dark circus of screams. Hers is among them, but he can do nothing to stop it. He mourned briefly before he completely stepped, deciding that if his fears made him a monster, he might as well play the part full time. And the ultimate kicker, other than the internal stuff, Reaver faces no consequences for his deeds. He kills artists for not capturing him perfectly. He encourages your bad behavior acting like a posh shoulder devil. And he barely even tries to hide how he plans to betray us. Lucian and I had a gentleman's agreement. How dare he betray me? And just when I was in the middle of trying to betray you! How inconvenient. But, again, we need his help. So we're gonna have to grin and bear it. I feel like we could have delved deeper into the complexities of how he was shaped like this, but hey, we still got a fun, amoral character, made even better by Stephen Fry's voice acting. <laughs> When it comes to Pokemon, you'd honestly be shocked by how dark some of its villains get. And a diamond, pearl, and platinum, we get a man who's an absolute anomaly even by this franchise's standards. The supreme leader of Team Galactic, Cyrus. This guy is creepy. Being the leader of a villainous organization, he's already on the headlines of Sinnoh's Most Wanted. Team Galactic gets really busy, not only stealing Pokedexes, but they go as far as bombing a lake to draw out legendary Pokemon. But nobody, not even Cyrus's loyal admins, is aware of just how far his plans go. See, Cyrus doesn't like people. Believing the human heart is inherently flawed, that emotions are a weakness, Cyrus wants to use the emotional trio to draw out Dialga and Palkia, the gods of time and space, and use them to destroy the universe and remake it in his own twisted sense of peace, one where human emotion is gone. That is certainly a plan, and Cyrus is sure to wax poetic to you about his philosophy. And true to his goals, hearing Cyrus talk, it's chilling just how devoid of emotion he sounds, how little he seems to care about anything other than his lofty goals. And when you defeat him in Platinum, he's pretty chill with just staying in the distortion realm of being roomies with Giratina. You'd think being trapped in an eldritch hellscape for all eternity would be something to bother you, but he's just fine with it. But his plans don't even stop there. In Masters, Cyrus runs into Darkrai and finds that the endless dark nightmare of pure nothingness that the ghoulish phantom subject his victims to is just the type of empty universe he can get behind. Cyrus sees putting people into a void of darkness 
as a kindness. And that's the thing. Cyrus feels little malice with what he does. It's just cold, hard logic with this guy. And you find enjoyment in this? Oh no, I feel absolutely nothing as I'm saying it. But the funny thing is, as much as he wants to deny it, Cyrus still feels some emotion and connections to certain things. He has a crowbat for starters, and anyone who's raised one of those can tell you you need to max its friendship to get Golbat to evolve. But more interestingly, you can meet his grandfather in Platinum. He tells you that as a boy, Cyrus never really was able to live up to the expectations of his parents and found solace in machines instead. Couple this with a strange note from a child fawning over a Rotom in Team Galactic's base and his interest in the Rotom decks in the Rainbow Rocket storyline and it almost humanizes Cyrus as someone who could just never really click with other people and thought he could fix humanity like he would a machine. Fun fact, by the way, despite how he looks in Axe, he's only 27 years old. All that brooding might not have been the best for his health as it turns out. Fire Emblem Binding Blade. Some of you may be surprised that I hardly ever talked about this game, considering it is the one where my boy Roy came from. Well, between the fact that it's unlocalized and Roy turning out to not be the best protagonist in the world, it's a little tough to get through. Seriously, Roy, why don't you promote early enough so you can fight mid-game? I wanna like you, man! Don't do this to me! But we're not here to talk about Roy. We're here to talk about arguably the best character in the game. Zephiel, the King of Burn. In the story of Binding Blade, Zephiel is a mad tyrant who seeks revenge against mankind for their greedy and disloyal nature. He waged war on all the nations of Alibe, conquering them with the aid of dragons, whom he believed would rule the land far better than humans ever will. Unlike most evil kings, Zephiel isn't a puppet leader. He's the one who commands the loyalty of the Dark Dragon instead of the other way around, which really paints a picture of how powerful and meticulous he is on his own. He has no respect for his own generals, dismissing their opinions and demanding they follow his every whim, even to the point of ordering the deaths of anyone, and I mean anyone, who stands in his way. Not even the sliver of care he still has left for his sister could dissuade him from his cause. But what sort of upbringing caused this deep-rooted disdain for humanity? Well, in the localized prequel, Blazing Blade, Zephyl is shown to be a once good-hearted prince who only wanted the approval of his father. Daddy issues. Sadly, he was discriminated against due to his mixed heritage, and his father's been trying to get him off his back. Zephiel was threatened with assassinations, and even had his bond with his sister sabotaged. His mother ain't much better, since she keeps flaunting him around as a sign of their birthright. But hey, she did at least try to make amends with him, until she mysteriously kicked the bucket. Yeah, Desmond makes Bernadetta's dad look like Geralt in comparison. And I thought I was evil. After how awfully he's treated, Zephiel could only see darkness. Intentional or not, he's molded to see how fragile goodwill is in the face of hatred and cruelty, sprung out of petty desires like blood, money, and status. By the time he slew his father, he's far too jaded to feel any guilt or remorse for turning away from his once noble self. Even his plan to conquer Alibe only further justifies his point. All these nations were betrayed by the very soldiers and nobles they sired because they would all rather join Zephiel, whether it was out of fear or to leech off his power. He single-handedly uprooted the corrupt nobility that plagued Alibe and indirectly showed how important it is for the good people of the land to bend together and set things right. Zephiel is a truly dangerous case of psychopathy by nurture. The man was a talented prince dedicated to doing good for his nation, and the way that relentless devotion carries over into his transformation as a tyrant is downright morbid. Denying him happiness for a lifetime is truly one of the worst mistakes anyone in Fire Emblem could ever and has ever made. <laughs> <sighs> 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 
Plowy. In this world, it's kill or be killed. <laughs> Longtime fans remember back when I made top 10 evil characters. Yeah, Flowey was only barely omitted from that list because Undertale took the internet by storm just a mere month before that video was released. Needless to say, this was a long time coming. The result of an experiment gone wrong fusing the ashes of Azrael, the late son of the Underground's royal family, with a flower to just see what would happen if you give life to something without a soul. Flowey's absolute nothing like the shy goat boy he once was. When he first came to life, Flowey found himself filled with so much determination that he had mastered saving and loading. So with godlike power, he quickly became bored. This is why I was always getting bored, because it says BORING! He tried everything to really elicit any sort of emotion. He befriended everyone in the underground, but felt no real connection to them. So he reset and then decided to kill everyone instead over and over again. And through it all, Flowey felt nothing. <laughs> Given his existential nightmare of a life, Flowey literally cannot feel any positive emotions and his glee at watching you squirm and struggle is only a facade because once he recognizes that you have the same powers as he used to, he expects you to do the same things he did. Do a neutral run? Flowey expects you to kill him without hesitation and gets really upset when you don't, genuinely confused at the idea of mercy towards him. On the no mercy route, Flowey finds kinship in you, recognizing Char's influence and acknowledges that you're both empty inside. Come the end of the run, Flowey calls out those who just watch videos of the genocide run as spineless without the guts to do it themselves before reasoning that Chara, his best friend, would kill him out of boredom. And in the pacifist run, driven purely by the idea of becoming whole, Flowey manipulates everyone in the underground to one place just to absorb all their souls and become Azrael again, only for the realization and guilt from everything he did to come crashing down on him like a truck. The sheer contrast between the two only highlights just how literally heartless Flowey is. Put it all together and Flowey's nightmarish actions and kill or be killed philosophy all but solidify his placement here. Even in the No Mercy run, he just sees his past relationship with Chara as less of the tight friendship they had in life and more of a case of mutual tolerance. In a game where you have the potential to be the bigger evil, Flowey still ends up standing out as one of the most horrific villains to ever come out of the indie scene. All of this from a flower. Whatever Toby Fox is cooking with Deltarune, if it's even remotely like this, we are not prepared. We've had manipulative psychos, violent psychos, apathetic psychos, sadistic psychos, and way more than I wish we could have talked about, but there is one psychopath that combines them all. Here's Teremy! Oh man, it's been a while since we talked about Blaze Blue. And we are coming back with the god of chaos himself. Yuki Terumi is one of gaming's biggest trolls. Anyone who's played Continuum Shift or seen Quarter Guy talk about him knows just how much of a treat it is to watch him go. He always comes in at the worst moments to make characters' lives an even bigger hell and make the players swear to whatever god they believe in. Too bad Terumi probably backstabbed them and smiled while doing it. When you first meet him, he seems pretty normal, if not a bit condescending. But then you find out he's actually the guy who possessed Jin to cut off Ragna's arm, killed their foster mother, and kidnapped their sister to copy her body to make robots and vessels for gods. Yeah, and he was laughing the whole time. That is barely 5% of what he is involved with. Seriously, Termi's behind everything. 
Ragnar's tragedy, the Ikaruga War, the Librarium as a whole, humanity finding the Amaterasu unit, and the Murakumo units. Every evil or tragic thing that occurs in every character's life in Blaze Blue could in some way be traced back to this a-hole. He's an a-hole. He doesn't care about anyone. He just wants to break the chains of his fate to become a free god. He would submit himself and then backstab anyone he wants for his goal. And he revels in it. It literally gives him sustenance. Coming in, gloating at how he got the upper hand, and then just brutally torturing someone is akin to anyone else eating. Just look at any scene of Hazama or Terumi in the games, and you'll just be impressed by how much of a <laughs> hole this guy is. It is no surprise that he ends up being the main villain of the series. He does everything, and I mean everything, to accomplish his goals. What I listed earlier doesn't come close to the total destruction and insanity that he goes through on a whim. And this is a series with people like Relius Clover and Itsunami, whose actions make war criminals seem pleasant. Terumi really is the end all of video game psychopaths. Even in the rabbit hole of Blaze Blue, he's the one thing people remember and love most about it. Now, if he's so good, why is he only number two? Well, Terumi is someone who revels in his psychopathy so much that he doesn't even bother hiding it. Number one is subtle, and even more important, doesn't feel anything, not even joy, from what they cause. <music> Albert Wesker, Resident Evil, a greater good Fruit Loop trying to destroy humanity to save it. Andrew and Ashley, Coffin of Andy and Laylee, the brother-sister cannibal duo with a toxic bond that's more disturbing than any demon. Vladimir Makarov, Call of Duty, the ends justify the means, so why not end everyone on his way to the top? The real Alex Mercer, prototype. Says a lot about a guy when the super virus parading his corpse around and eating people's memories has a better view of humanity than he does. Cazador, Baldur's Gate 3. This guy fucked Asterion up. Figuratively and unfortunately literally. Xemnas, Kingdom Hearts 2. Would have made the list very high on the list. If not for Dream Drop Distance, ruining his character! Louie from Pikmin. If you know, you know. Sephiroth, Final Fantasy. Turns out, learning your entire reason for existing is because a corporation grew you in a lab from a weird alien goddess so they could achieve godhood isn't really the best thing for your mental health. Who knew? <laughs> Good evening, citizens and leaders of the world. Minutes ago, operatives working for Advance detonated nuclear explosives simultaneously in four major cities across the continent. Um, what the f What you just saw was a message from Prime Minister Julia Salisbury, a politician from a little game called Not For Broadcast. In short, it's an FMV player choice game where you edit a live news broadcast and control what people see and hear through the media. All the while, your dystopian British nation faces increasing political turmoil. Julia is a representative of the Advance Party, and the game's first broadcast shows her, alongside Peter Clement, giving their address after having been elected as the nation's prime ministers. From watching the broadcast, Julia appears to be the more straightforward politician of the two. Conversely, Peter is an aloof and sailor mouth drunkard who used to be a TV personality. Gee, I wonder who that's based off of. You guessed it, Ronald Reagan. What? You'd think someone as old and off as rocker as he is would be moments away from snapping while in a position of power, right? Yeah, eh, not likely. In the last broadcast of the game's second act, we find that our nation has been at war with the nations of the World Council for 20 weeks after they voted to cut off our nation's supply chain. But while a literal war is going on, the National Nightly News is more interested in showcasing exploitative pop stars and washed up stage performers. <laughs> oh, what the heck? Give us a hug.
That is, until a mighty rumble kills your equipment and interrupts the broadcast. And by the time it comes back online, the amount of casualties has spiked to over 14 million people. And guess who was responsible for that? Me. Yes, it's me. I know you were a waiting. Keep in mind, the possibility of all of these deaths being enemy soldiers is slim to none. Most of these were likely civilians or tourists. And yet Julia not only blows them all sky high, but she even threatens on live television to set off more explosives if the World Council doesn't surrender their nations and citizens to Advance's new future. I don't think you need to be a politician to know that using genocide as a method of coercing several foreign governments into compliance is a very serious bad thing. Julia already cemented herself as a genocidal dictator, and yet she's somehow worse than that. Throughout the game's third act, we hear more and more people unable to have children, or at least unable to have children that aren't born with several birth defects. Why? Because Julia had the bright idea to slip chemicals meant to induce infertility into her government sanctioned food boxes as a test for opt out contraception. Without the public's knowledge or consent. When this inevitably went south, Julia decided the best thing to do was to blame the nation's sterility on her bombs and manipulate people's perceptions towards starting a family so she wouldn't lose supporters. Co-Prime Minister Peter Clement never tried using lies and manipulation to keep himself in office. Julia even calls her fellow politician her conscience right before it's revealed that she had him assassinated after he threatened to publicly destroy her reputation. Ready to change your vote now? Well, too bad, because Julia not only has elections suspended, but anyone who disagrees with her policies gets sent to betterment facilities. It's at this point the phrase literally Hitler ceases to be a meme. And yet, despite all her crimes, she cannot stop giving excuses. Oh, the only other solution to the mass infertility was to destroy the nation's livestock? Oh, that sounds awful. Maybe you should have thought of that before making your country your lab rats. As for the bombings, her best excuse boils down to, it was tough love. Maybe you call it cruel, but others would call it love, tough love. Oh, I see. She was just doing what was required. Any decent leader would have done the same thing. After all, would you rather have the other side's policy? Now, those familiar with Not For Broadcast will recall that, yes, if you want, you can absolutely side with her and assist in her dictatorship. But unlike Alan James, the Disrupt Party spokesman and Julia's antithesis, you can't change her actions by making different choices. It doesn't matter who you support. She still does all that without a sliver of remorse. At this point, it only makes sense that the most corrupt politician imaginable would serve as a contender for the top spot. And considering her actions, her holier-than-thou attitude about them, and the fact that citizens have literally described her as cold and emotionless, Julia Salisbury has definitely earned my vote. For number one, not prime minister. I'm the Fiery Joker, and hopefully no more of my broadcasts get interrupted by a cop. Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.